I'm going to pass it on to Lorenzo from the Honors Program, who is also our Commissioner of Marketing on ASG. But Lorenzo. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you. How are you? How are you, students? Yeah, How are you, people? Good? We're great. Ready for this? Yeah. I think it will be very interesting. And as my name is Lorenzo Marchetti, I am Italian first. Second, <laughs> I am the co president of the Honors Program. I would like to remind you that our motto is expect more, be more, and we want all of you to be more. And we are here co sponsoring this event because we believe that uh, this kind of discussion will help all of us to be more. So now, thank you. I will introduce David, that is the mind behind this beautiful event. Thank you for coming. Have a good day. Um, just really quick on the structure of the debate. Uh, it'll be 15 minutes intro from each of our professors, and then we'll have 10 minute rebuttals. And then afterwards, uh, Christian and I will be having microphones. You guys can just raise your hands and we'll um, uh, take your questions. So without further ado, um, Professor Mark Bobro. All right, hello. Um, I don't have much to say except to introduce our honored speakers. We have uh, Professor Mark McIntyre, who's going to um, surprisingly enough, defend, I guess, the existence of God. Um, <laughs> just picked it randomly. And uh, um, Professor jo Joseph White, or Joe White, um, will present the other side, arguing that God, we can argue that God does not exist. So welcome um, our two debaters, right? Professors here. Thank you. Well, hello. Hello there. How are you? Um, a little over 50 years ago, I was a seminarian in Washington, D.C., and the superior general of uh, my religious order that I was attached to called me into his office after I finished my master's thesis and degree in the subjectivity of Zorin Kierkegaard, and he said to me, Mark? I said, yes. He said, Mark, we're going to send you to Rome to study canon law. And I said, really? It's kind of law. I said, why? And he said, because God needs good lawyers. I said, that's astonishing. I didn't even know we had been arrested. What's the charge? Well, that's why we're here tonight. The charge is that God is guilty, apparently, of non-being. And before I launch into that, I want to spend just a little bit of my precious time to thank Professor Joe White and our new chairman, Professor Mark Bobro, for providing a philosophy department where you can talk about things like this without fear of being fired or without fear of uh, uh, any ill will. Arist Aristotle reminds us that the purpose of argument is not winning or losing. The purpose of argument is to make progress in knowing. And so if that is the spirit within which philosophers usually have a debate. And that will probably be the way it goes tonight. Not only am I going to be God's lawyer this evening, but I'm going to actually uh, defend this proposition that God not only exists, but God is existence itself. God is ends qua ends, being as being. And there's a lesser charge that God is uh, accused of, as you see, the case against God is affirming God's existence is both irrational, we hear this a lot, very popular idea that only troglodytes, morons, fools, and idiots believe in the existence of God. Well, I think I can brush that little charge away rather quickly. We also hear that evil in the world negates the existence of God. Also, I think I can destroy that pretty easily. So God, but the main charge God is non-being. It's an extraordinary, it's an extraordinary idea that God should not be, especially if you consider some of the classical arguments for God's existence. Now, when I present my case for my attorney, do not falsely suppose that I actually believe what my client has to say. 
You know about attorneys. They can defend a ham sandwich, and often do, by the way. <laughs> there is something rather than nothing. I think that's pretty well manifest. I think even Professor White will agree with that, that there is obviously something rather than nothing. And it's interesting how ancient minds, going back to Aristotle, wrestled with this question, that God not only exists, but God is existence itself, because there has to be a necessary being in order for anything to be. If there was no one being that was necessary, how did everything happen? And obviously something did happen, because we're here talking about it, for one thing. As A.J. Ayer points out in his Language, Truth, and Logic, in a very short chapter, Ayer says, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the theist says that something exists that we can't sense. That's nonsense. And then the atheist says, oh, that thing that the, the theist talks about, <laughs> that doesn't exist. Ayer says, atheism is also literally nonsense. But he saves his most severe criticism for the agnostic. He said, the agnostic says, oh, one of these two guys is right. I don't know, maybe. So uh, agnosticism really is I don't know, from the Greek, I don't know, to know or not to know. But finally, we have this, pantheism. Been getting a lot of attention recently. People like uh, Pierre Théard de Chardin, even Albert Einstein. I'll reference a little bit later. So that should clear up some of the, some of the terminological uh, things that we need to discuss. Now, thesis number one, I shall argue, uh, having a concept of God is indeed rational. Contrary to the opinions of many people, I believe that it's rational. Uh, and I believe it's rational because it is reasonable. Not everything that's rational is also reasonable. It's rational to prohibit people from swimming in a, in a reservoir, right? But it's, it's not reasonable to arrest and prosecute and convict first responders who dive into the water to what? Rescue a child. That's not reasonable. The next thing that we do in critical thinking is we define the terms of our premises. Here's how I define. Concepts of God that are rational. Major term. Sensible ideas free of contradiction. What would be a contradiction? God exists and God doesn't exist. That's a contradiction. I'm here and I'm not here. That's a contradiction. Minor term, God, uh, concepts of God. Ideas about the source of being itself. Ends qua ends. Now, I'm loading the definition here just to give bait. <laughs> so, he makes it. <laughs> I, I can see his eyes widening, yes. And finally, the magic middle term, the term that connects the major to the minor, concepts that are reasonable. What is this? Ideas that are coherent, consistent, and correspondent to logic and or experience from common sense. This could also include things like a theory of knowledge based upon intuition. Let's try this out. I'm going to argue uh, the existence of God uh, from the uh, notions of necessity and contingency. I've already started to, to wet your Premise number one, everything that exists contingently has a reason for its existence. By the way, all of these premises are very, very negotiable, very arguable, and Professor White can't, he's writing something down. See what I told you, he's writing it down. Premise number two, the universe exists contingently. Well, Bertrand Russell doesn't agree with that. Bertrand Russell says, no, why can't the universe just be, you know, something that, yeah, sort of, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Uh, that's how Bertie talks. Uh, and so therefore, the universe has a reason for its existence. If the universe has a reason for its existence, then that reason is God, therefore God exists. Now, that's my thesis argument and I'm going to rely upon Thomas Aquinas to uh, make the case for me with a purely analytic argument. An analytic argument is based upon the pure ideas themselves, the notions themselves, the concepts themselves. Next, <clears throat> if for all ex extant objects they do not exist at some time, then given infinite time, there would be nothing in existence now. Nothing can come from nothing, the Latin expression, nihil, ex nihil, nihil fit. You probably heard that. There is no creation uh, for individual existent objects. But in fact, many objects exist in the universe. Therefore, a necessary being, ends qua ends. God not only exists, but God is existence itself, is what Aquinas says. A being of which it is impossible that it should not exist that being exists. But it comes down to this, there must exist something which 
has to exist, which cannot not exist. Uh, this sort of being is called necessary being. Either this nece necessity belongs uh, to the thing itself, or it is derived from another. If derived from another, there must be ultimately exist a being whose necessity is not derived, that is, an absolutely necessary being, which we call God. It is perfectly rational and reasonable to believe in the existence of God. But what does it mean to say God? Who is this God? What is this God? We've just gone through arguments that, that talk about existence itself being God. You know, not, the, not the, the, the bearded old white guy floating on a cloud with an Excel spreadsheet keeping track of, of your business. No, not that God. No, no, not that God at all. No. So that's the God that, that, that I wish to defend. I wish to defend that kind of a God. But I also want to defend another way of talking about God and pursuing God. Because one of the things I would like to suggest to you is that God is a lifelong pursuit. It's not something to be settled in a philosophy class, or even in a marriage, or at the end of a marriage. And I introduce uh, Zoran Kierkegaard. I know I did my master's thesis on the guy, so I, I really like what he has to say. But he presents a very different way of approaching this. He says that on the matter of faith, on the matter of believing in God or not believing in God, it's an inner directed thing. It's not something in the objective world. And in fact, the more, you the more you pursue God in the objective world, the more you're going to miss it. You're not going to get it, because it can only be approached from within. Now, Kierkegaard is known to be, what, in your philosophy classes, the granddaddy of existentialism. Per perhaps few of you realize that the uh, existentialism was born with a theist, not an atheist. So his argument is over there. It's not really an argument, uh, but I would like to highlight uh, uh, he says, for subjective reflection, the truth becomes a matter of appropriation, of inwardness, of subjectivity, and thought must penetrate deeper and still deeper into the subjective and his subjectivity. So you might say, well, gee, I'm contradicting myself. First of all, I'm trying to prove that God is existence itself, and now I'm trying to tell you, trying to sell you another, another bag of beans and tell you that you got to look inside. Old professor of mine, Father McLean, said, Mark, never choose either or when you can have both and. So my recommendation is both and. Right? In fact, one of Kierkegaard's famous works is called Either Or. <laughs> so one more thing, pantheism. One of my favorite characters, this guy, this guy right here, right? What does he have to say? He says, I am fascinated by says pantheism. Now, wait a second. Philosophers debate this. This is not a closed. Spinoza himself, I can show you passages where he said, I'm not an atheist. I'm not a, a, a pantheist. But what does he mean? Because he is the first philosopher who deals with the soul and the body as one thing, not as two separate things. A lot of the problem for the existence of God comes down to this split between matter and spirit that was infused into Western philosophy by the early Greeks. You've covered this in your ancient philosophy classes. But now it's time for <laughs> <laughs> Professor White to defend <laughs> or, or refute the, the, the flying spaghetti god. And don't forget uh, Bertrand Russell's uh, uh, celestial teapot. Thank you for listening. Oh, where's my PowerPoint? I'll tell you where my PowerPoint is. <laughs> I'll show you my PowerPoint. Uh, Kill it. Well, let's just get down to this. Let's, let, I'd just like to clarify a few things at first. First of all, thank everybody for putting all this on. This is great. Um, this started. <laughs> it started with uh, in a faculty discussion a couple years ago, wanting more academic. Uh, activities on campus for students in the community. So this is going well, thank you. Um, oh, golly, where do you start with that? Oh, here's where I start. I was in a seminary for, uh, I was in a seminary for four years. Not, I didn't go as far as Mark did. And uh, as Mark was in the seminary and his, the father finally said, you know, you need to go to the Vatican. 
as God needs lawyers. Uh, I was told, you need to leave the seminary. You should, pr you should probably be a lawyer. Because <laughs> I argued all the time. <laughs> so uh, we had different seminary experiences. But I was in a Catholic seminary where, you know, you get a good four years of Latin, a couple years of Greek, and then you get French on the side, no Italian back then. And uh, it was good education. They give you good educations. And uh, it was a, that was a journey. And much of it was visited in this kind of way that Mark does it in a sort of medieval way, right? I mean, he spends a lot of time a couple thousand years ago with Aquinas. That's, that's cozy, right? So what, what do I want to do? Let's just go through this and talk about this. Because what I represent is, is some good news and some bad news. And so we'll go with the good news first. But just to kind of clarify, Einstein was one of our outstanding historical scientists. But, Sin but Spinoza was not the first modern philosopher, ancient philosopher, to join those two. All right, that's just a historical error. But he's not a philosopher. That's okay, right? He did great physics, mediocre philosophy. So I just warn against the quotes here for uh, philosophy. So, uh, here's, here's what I want to talk about in terms of the good news. And that is, the question here is, does God exist? And this is such a big topic for homo sapiens, and has been for years, that if you look at the world, the social sciences of anthropology, history, sociology, and psychology, for example, there's so much to be learned about religion and about God, right? This is a big thing. There's a book that's recently come out by a, a couple uh, cognitive scientists at Harvard called The Enigma of Reason. I encourage you to read it, particularly those who are philosophically disposed. How many people here are in my class? Anybody from my class? Cool. Everybody's here, everybody here knows what epistemology is? And we're good? All right, most people know. So, uh, anyway, the way we often talk about knowledge involves justification, reasoning. According to anthropologists who look back in time, reasoning may not have evolved for that reason. Rather, it evolved to create community. And it allowed people to start veering toward more abstraction in their life so that diversity could be shared amongst all these people. Now, you know in our culture there's an adage that around the dinner table there are two things you're not supposed to talk about. What are those? Religion and politics. Why not? Well, you never get anywhere, <laughs> right? But again, if you're with a group of people that, well, we, we see it sometimes now in politics, that like to be surrounded by a bubble of similar people, right? Then you get to talk about a whole lot of stuff and feel good about yourself, right? And you really get to bond. So it may be that religion and God talk played a big role in helping homo sapiens fulfill this need to be these ultra or hyper uh, social beings, right? And there's much to be learned from all of this. So anthropologically, there's a big role that religion has played in our, in our development. Historically, people tend to have a view these days that religion has been the source of a great deal of conflict, right? That you trace back many wars to that. But also, when you come into the United States anyway, in the early 19th century, the abolition movement was really sparked and carried forth by Christians who found a religious problem with slavery, right? So there's so much to be discovered about the power and the value of religion as it's played out in our 8,000 years at least of uh, civilized existence, right? Then you come forward in terms of sociology and such interesting things are happening. Right now in the United States, if you go back to the 19th century, well over 90% of the American population identified as Protestant, right? How many people here would identify, say, as Lutheran? <laughs> Methodist? Catholic? One? And, and kind of hesitant, <laughs> right? And again, if you follow the Pew Research Foundation on religion, you find that, say, just in the last seven years in the United States, there is close to 80% of the population identified as Christian, right, which included both Catholics and Protestants. In just seven years, it's dropped down to 71%. 
what groups have increased? Atheist. More people are atheist today and non-affiliated. How many of you just don't belong to any church at all? Anybody? See, welcome. <laughs> welcome to the modern world. How many of you just sat there and went, oh, yeah, you can't get something from nothing. <laughs> there must be God. Okay, uh, interesting. Thanks for sharing. <laughs> it's like, well, again, where it's not getting a grip, right? And so you see sociologically how, how the entire populations are shifting, right? Then you come down to the psychology of it. And then it gets very fascinating. And those of you who've read a little Karl Marx or you've read Sigmund Freud, you know, there's wonderful psychological, sociological reasons why people believe in God. And these came out in the 19th century after so many of these arguments that my esteemed colleague appealed to, going back to Aquinas in the 13th century, and coming all the way forward to Leibniz in the 18th century, <laughs> that were abandoned. And abandoned, we'll see in a minute, for some pretty good reasons. Right? You got the fallacy of composition and Aquinas. You just, you, they're just they're riddled with issues. Right? And so people started to lose that sense that there was this deity. But psychologically, it runs a gamut in terms of how it affects us. People have experiences of the sacred. Right? And then as Mark ended with Kierkegaard, the real big question comes up. You can have these huge experiences, but how does that experience tie to what's outside of your experience? How does that experience map on to something external to you? Right? So again, in philosophy, people who study this difference between appearance and reality, it's not a question whether or not people see ghosts. People see ghosts. They just don't exist. Right? So we know that people have all sorts of thoughts and things happen, but they don't map into the world. Right? So, let me tell you what's, let me make a couple remarks about philosophy, since that's where my esteemed colleague went primarily. In the world of philosophy, there are different areas here to talk about. So let's talk about contemporary political philosophy. Contemporary political philosophy, one strain way it has it, is that this kind of language, religious language, specific in particular, it's surrounded by what's known as the burdens of judgment. And that is that reasonable, smart people are not going to come to a consensus over this. It's, there's too much subtlety, there's too much going on. As we'll see in a minute, and as Mark alluded to, right, there's a, there's a metaphysical view that has to go on here for this God talk to work. Or, the, well, it could be a couple different views. But anyway, it's a metaphysical issue. So this question, does God exist, can't be answered by history. It can't be answered by anthropology. It can't be answered by sociology or psychology. It's outside of their domains. They can tell us what people believe and how this stuff has worked. The question is a philosophical question, and specifically it's a logical and metaphysical question. But in the world of political philosophy, the claim is at this point that, yeah, you're going to sit around the dinner table, chances are you're not going to change somebody's mind, right? You may not come, to, you probably won't come to a consensus, so the view is to recognize that people are just going to profoundly differ over this. And the role of political philosophy then is to articulate a model where you can have such tremendous diversity but still fairness or stability. Because in the past the goal had always been a homogeneous society. So if you go back just a little uh, outside of Aquinas, as the Catholic Church started to face heretics, they didn't say, well, I guess people just disagree, right? said, no, we'll just kill you, right? <laughs> so at that point, if you have that old view that somehow we're going to be able to resolve these things, then you end up with an inquisition or somebody. You need to homogenize your culture. And we still see this going on with ISIS. That's a perfect contemporary example, right? They're trying to homogenize. Everybody's got to be like them. And if the contemporary world is right, contemporary philosophy is right, it's not going to happen. Now, that's from political philosophy. And in political philosophy where we are today is that you have a right to your beliefs. You want to be Hindu? You want to be Jewish? You want to be Catholic, Protestant, Buddhist? You can do that. Miss Le Pen in uh, France is having a hard time with hajibs, but, you know, here you could probably wear that. And so we're working on what is the level of tolerance for all of this diversity, but we recognize you need to be tolerant. 
So you get to believe all these things. You don't in logic. You don't in metaphysics. You don't get freedom of belief. You've got to follow the argument and the evidence. And so we want to talk about what might be specious evidence. So what's happened now is by the time you get to 18, uh, early 1800s, you have people like Pierre Laplace, who's a leading scientist at the time. And the big question that comes up at this point is, as he explains what science is doing, he's asked. Now, you've given this whole description of science. And all of you who are science majors now, you know that just given our science, where we came from, there's a disposition we're risen apes. We share all this DNA with chimps, right? We're physical beings. And now you can trace how far back to what we think is the beginning since the WMAP project in 2001, right? The universe is about 13.77 billion years old. We talk about things like big bangs, right? How many people are totally into leptons, quarks, bosons? Come on, fermions. What do you, what do you got going for you, <laughs> right? So we have this monstrous language now that talks about this physical universe. And Laplace was asked, well, where's God? And some of you in philosophy know his response was, yeah, I have no need for that hypothesis. I don't need it. Everything's taken care of. Is that true? <laughs> That's the big question, right? So when Mark gives us arguments that you cannot get something from nothing, is that true? Yep. One says, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody in quantum physics? You get something from nothing. It happens pretty frequently. This is old stuff. You know, Aquinas is an Aristotelian. We don't use that physics anymore. That's outdated, right? So we don't, we don't even use Newtonian physics on the grand level and the small level. So I would, at this point, invite my colleague into the 20th century. <laughs> I would invite you to come forward, let the medieval period go, Right? And again, you start to see that human beings at one point had this view about themselves. Right? And this, is, this will take us into the metaphysics. What are you? Well, for much of our history, the popular view, not always the view, this wasn't Aristotle's view going back in time, it certainly wasn't Hobbes's view even in the modern period. I guess Einstein didn't read Hobbes. The view that, this view that somehow are these two things. I'm a mind, I'm a thing that thinks, a soul, a body, inside of this physical body, right? I'm like a ghost in a machine. And I can move this body, right? And this body can do things to me, right? So, like, oh, don't do that, <laughs> right? So we have this, this soul inside of a body. And not only do we have a soul inside of a body, but it can leave, right? It can leave the body and it can travel, right? It can travel to paradise, hell, right? Which is a whole other argument about God. That was a really good idea, wasn't it? Hell. So <laughs> here you have, you have this view and it's come down to us in times known as substance dualism. And God is a substance, a, th a thing that somehow thinks, that has intellectual ability, that in some forms cares about us, that is powerful perhaps, right? And this is all on the side of positive theology. You can always go the other way and say, can't say anything about God. Well, then don't say anything at all, right? But on the positive side, they make these claims about this being. So he is not body. This is body. This doesn't have a soul but we are a combination, right? So, you know, as human beings start thinking about this, they start saying, well, what are these things? What am I, this physical being in space? And then this thinking thing. And it doesn't seem to make any sense to ask, how long are my dreams spatially? <laughs> Temporally, but we don't seem to have 12-foot dreams shaped like acorns or something, right? So it's a, what, what are we talking about? If this thing is non-spatial, this is spatial, how do these things, how does something go someplace? Isn't that a spatial thing? What are we talking about here? And if you study the history of philosophy, you start to see people went, this is broken. 
this view doesn't work, right? And then as science continues growing, and now we know so much more about neurology, and it's like, what are we dealing with? Now, you still have remnants of, of this dualism, this thing that there's private mental phenomena out there. There's still remnants of that, but there are no ghosts left. The ghosts are gone. And so what do we do in the 21st century? What could God possibly be if he's not some super-duper ghost? So again, I think the kind of existential situation you're dealing with, you're in a world where you're experiencing the loss of institutional religion. If you go back to Marx Aquinas, just one church in the West, the Catholic Church. Then the 16th century, it shattered. And it's continued shattering. Now, you, anybody have grandparents that belong to a religion? Oh, parents. Oh, and you. <laughs> What's happening? It's, it's shattering. And I think it's shattering because you're starting, to, you're starting to understand, right, that this sort of talk is problematic, right? And so I'll leave it that dual, substance dualism is broken. We're probably not going to find any spirits, which doesn't mean people don't see spirits. People see people walk on water. People have seen pizzas multiplied. That's not the problem, right? The problem is, does it really happen? And I think there's enough metaphysical information now to say, no, that stuff doesn't go on. You're much more likely to get kicked by a leprechaun than, than go to heaven. Not that you're bad people, but it's just probably not going to happen. So, am I okay? Do I have more time? <laughs> okay, I'll end it there. We're ready. God, where do I begin? God love you, Joe, for one thing. Uh, <laughs> I thank God that he's given me so much material to, to, re, to re, refute. First of all, he conflates religion with God. Religion with spirituality, not true. A lot of, I've had some conversations. If Johan is here, Johan and I had a conversation in the library the other day. And he was unaware that you could have uh, a concept of God uh, and not have a religion. Of course, he's from Sweden, which is very, very atheistic in Sweden. Very atheistic. Secondly, uh, I was really fascinated by, by uh, uh, the very clever footsteps and choreography as Professor White danced from Aristotle through Aquinas, through Leibniz, and said, well, gee, he stopped at Leibniz. Well, actually, I was going to bring it up to Théâtre de Chardin. I right? was waiting. I had the last slide, but I didn't want to pull that one on you. I, I knew you'd fall for my trap, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Théâtre de Chardin, French Jesuit. You know about the Jesuits, the, the, the Pope who uh, uh, is uh, now in Rome, uh, is a, a Jesuit. And uh, Jesuits have had a very rocky relationship with uh, the Vatican and with the Catholic Church. Many of the, many of the opposition movements within the Church came from Jesuits. As a matter of fact, the, the Italian cardinals forbade there to be a Jesuit pope after the, they only had one before Francis. He wasn't too popular. If you, uh, the, 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 the assumption here uh, that Joe is making, I think, uh, is interesting. That, that if, you, if you still believe in God, you're medieval. In fact, he used the word medieval. And you're not modern. And there's something wonderful and spectacular about being modern people. We're now modern. Oh, yeah. We're no longer medieval. No, we're modern people, see. Modern is much better. I get this in my term papers a lot, by the way, that modern, modern. And then the odd populum. How many people, you know, asking uh, an audience, how many people have, have a religion? And then, you know, uh, it, the, the idea that if it's popular, so if this crowd believes uh, in the non-being of God, then what's my conclusion? Am I supposed to go home and rethink my whole uh, attitude about this problem? Probably not. But the most stunning thing, <laughs> the most stunning thing about uh, Professor White's presentation was this thing about uh, as he came as close as he possibly could to the thrust of my real argument, ends qua ends, God, God is not only existing, God is existence itself. He danced around that by bringing in quantum physics by saying, well, quantum physics, uh, they, they say, say that you can bring something from nothing. Now, let's, let's look at that from a logician's point of view. If I say that something is nothing and nothing is something, 
Does that make any sense? Something is nothing and nothing is something. If, if quantum physics actually says that they can bring something from nothing, then let's close all the schools and all go home because language has failed, okay? Totally failed, right? To prove this, I will simply ask one question, and I do not want show of hands. It may embarrass you or your friends. Who here can tell me, including Professor White, what went bang? What went bang? Nobody can tell you what went bang. No. Oh, we've worked it out. We're scientists. We're modern. Oh, we got data. We have satellites. Oh, yes. We have radio frequency telescopes. One of my students actually showed me a picture of the universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looked like a football. It, was, it did look like a green football. And I said to him, what were you when you took this picture? It was a very strange, very strange conversation. Nobody can tell you what went bang, and yet we're supposed to say, oh, well, the God problem is irrelevant because we know, we know where everything came from. You don't. You don't know where everything came from. Sorry. The other thing that I found very encouraging about Professor White was this, and that is that I think we agree on this, that even though sociology, anthropology, and psychology have made tremendous contributions to this topic, by the way, psychological reasons, anthropological reasons, sociological reasons for people who believe in God, God of the old uh, kind. Uh, nevertheless, this problem is only to be worked out in philosophy because of the precisely the same thing that, 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 that Einstein was talking about. <laughs> Our brains are too small to figure this whole thing out. We like to pretend that we are, you know, uh, wearing, uh, you know, wearing, wearing uh, uh, the, the mantle of being uh, super intelligent and now modern, and we're, uh, we have all the answers. But Einstein was a humble thinker, I think, in, in, in his view. And when he says that, 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 that he sees a religious element in the universe itself, it does border on pantheism. As I said before, if I were to be attracted to a, a concept of God, it would probably be Théa de Chardin, plus uh, uh, Einstein. What did Chardin do? Chardin exactly confronted the problem that Professor White has talked about. He said that the problem with this God thing is this dichotomy between matter and spirit that has been infused in Western philosophy since the time, well, even before Socrates, even before that. Um, so if he, if he felt if he could, if he could mend that, that divine, that he would be able to work a, a theology or a concept of God that would be modern. He died in 1955 on the exact day he prophesied he would die, Easter Sunday in New York. He was forbidden to publish his Phenomenon of Man, which is his classic work. 13 volumes of, of, of philosophy. But he was forbidden by the Catholic Church now you know why I'm <laughs> no longer affiliated with that group, but forbidden to publish is an extraordinary idea. So he didn't get a chance to have any criticism. So there are very modern people, not just you know, up to the 17th or 16th century. There are, there are contemporary individuals, like my friend at Boston College, who still argue for the existence of God. But I was fascinated to see where we do agree and where we disagree on that. Who's next? <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's back up. A uh, <laughs> couple things here. I'm not sure, well, I'm not particularly concerned about what went bang. Anybody here? I know we have some physicists I'm and concerned. chemists here who, I'm concerned. You're, you're concerned. Uh, does anybody know when that term was coined? Late 1940s, yeah, like yeah. last century. Yeah. Like, come on, <laughs> what went bang? Right, we don't have all those answers right now. What makes up the vast mass of the universe? What's mo what's most the mass of the universe? Dark energy, right? Dark energy, and then dark matter. Why is it dark? <laughs> well, we don't know what it is. So let's just be honest, <laughs> right? We're learning a lot at a very quick level. Now let me ask you this, if we don't know what went bang, and I told you, I think I do, it was woo mm -hmm. <laughs> What would be your question? 
Woo-hoo-hoo. Woo-hoo-hoo's the creator. Woo-hoo-hoo's always been. What's he made out of? I don't know. Woo-hoo-hoo stuff. Man. How does woo-hoo-hoo live? With woo-hoo-hoo stuff all over. It's like, what are you talking about? And what, what I'm, I'm sorry, I'm back with Pascal. I got 13.77 billion years of a monstrous body of knowledge so diverse that one little area for any one of you could mark off your whole PhD and career and somebody's throwing spirits at me at this point? Come on. This is the modern period. It's not the Middle Ages. It's not medieval. So I, I'm okay. I'm okay getting rid of that, those spooky little things out there. Um, the other thing is about this whole thing about definition. Um, I didn't mean, if I did this, I didn't mean to simply equate religion and God. I think Buddhism is considered a world religion, and there's no God in it. And for those of you who've been in my class, and probably compared to world religion classes, you know, we talk about things like mystical experiences. These are very powerful experiences. They change people's lives. In some traditions, typically in the West, if you're Christian, you identify with some sort of union with God. Or if you're, if you're Hindu, you may have union with Brahman. But in Buddhism, the traditional, there's no God. This is a very powerful experience that you want to have, your nirvana experience. So I didn't mean to do that, uh, equa uh, equate those two. But there is something about these definitions of God for me that seem a little slippery, <laughs> right? I mean, we do come in, at this point, if you read the Pew study, the Pew research on religions, as I was telling you, how people have changed their views, Nonetheless, amongst people who identify as Christians, which both Catholic and Protestants, 71% of that group are certain that God exists. 80% believe in heaven. Some close to that believe in hell. So the traditional views of religion are the dominant po popular views. And that's not an argument for them, but that's what people believe. But then we have the Tillichs, the Deschardins, you know, the contemporary theologians who start redefining God, maybe as the ground of being, existence itself, right? It, it, it strikes me it's kind of like this. How many people, we have a health problem in the United States. It involves obesity, right? Certain parts of the country have it worse than other parts of the country. Anybody know where it's worse? So. Where? In the South, I think Alabama has one of the worst rates. <laughs> Part of it is because they eat so much fried food, right? And one of the popular items are French fries. Now, if you go to these people and you say, look, you've got to eat more fruit and vegetables. You've got to eat fewer French fries. You might really like French fries. You've got to stop eating French fries. It's, it's not good for you, but I love French fries. And you pull out, let's say, a banana, and you say, why don't you try this French fry? That's not a French fry. Can you just change a name and solve a problem? You know, again, what are you going to, if you keep changing the definition of God, it's like, come on, let it go. It, you're in a different world at this point. There's no, there aren't ghosts out there like that, all right? I think we're risen apes. I think we have a long history. How many people have ever visited the museum in Kentucky? where creation started 6,000 years ago. You seen it? Google it, you can, yeah, you can see it, right? And so we know where the dinosaurs came from. They were just kind of made up by God to keep us intrigued. Now granted, that's one definition of God, and that tended to be an easy target. But I don't know if we solve problems by coming forward and changing definitions so that it's, it, what, being, existence? Eh. And things do come from nothing. Now, the last thing I wanted to make a remark about, <laughs> Prove it. just to finish that up, uh, Prove it. I wasn't appealing to the group. This wasn't an odd populum. I was just seeing how many people actually had that belief, so I wasn't arguing for anything. And Marx's list of deism, theism, atheism, agnosticism, and pantheism all rest on a particular assumption about language. Right? And I can take a position which is different from all of those. So I could say I'm not an atheist, I'm not a theist, I'm not a th uh, agnostic or none of that. All of those are assuming that this language is about something. Right? It's talking about something in reality. Mm -hmm. So if I say that Donald Trump is president, I'm talking about something in the world. Right? And that thing happens to be president. I think he's, is he still president? He was this morning. <laughs> is he still? 
You never know. <laughs> Anybody know today's scandal? I haven't seen the news, so I haven't <laughs> kept up on it. So, but that's talking about a guy who's the president, right? By the same token, if I say Santa Claus lives in the North Pole, all of you know that's not true. There's no Santa Claus, right? You know that, right? But religious language may not be like that, right? When you go to a play, you see Hamlet. How many of you are sitting there going, where in Denmark did he live? What did he do on his fifth birthday? That's not the right way to think about that. That's a very powerful play. Drama is very powerful. We learn a lot from it, but it's not a language to talk about these people in the world. They're fictional. Same thing, I think, could be said for religious language. Very powerful. It tells us something, perhaps, about mystery, right? There seem to be differences among some of us think, just give science enough time, it'll solve everything. But we know it can't do normative work, right? Science is not going to tell us what we ought to do as a society, how we ought to treat each other. So when you hear scientists talking about a theory of everything, you know, that's just pretense, right? They're not going to get a theory of everything, of their world, but not of everything. So again, maybe there are things we're not going to figure out, right? And there are arguments in philosophy that suggest there are aspects of consciousness that we are just closed to. They happen, they occur, but we don't have the language to articulate how it works. Maybe that's enough. Maybe it's just going to be a mystery. So there could be mysteries, and religious language may be that. It's not that it's about some intelligence, something that cares about us. It's our confrontation with the sublime. And it's more like poetry than like, than like science or like history. It's not about the world. It's about us. I would leave it there. <laughs> All right, thank you so much, Professor McIntyre, Professor White. Um, I'm going to open it up to Q&A at this moment. Uh, my question is about um, St. Anselm's uh, idea. Ontolo I'm sure you're familiar with him. The ontological argument? Yes. Back from the 11th century? Back, yes. I wonder if you actually believe in uh, uh, the Constitution, because it was done so much, you know, it's much older than the modern time. But you keep saying that the argument is very old. That's come to the modern world, which, which is interesting. But even the very constitution you live by now, today, is framed way back in the old ages. And if you look at the philosophers that was based on, I, I mean, what's your take on that? That's a really good question. But and my main question is, <laughs> what is <laughs> what is your take about the Anselm's start that he said well, okay, the okay, fool you. thinks there is no God in his heart? Okay, I'll, I'll, let me answer your let me let me answer your question about the historical value of certain practices, like say the Constitution, right? And that was written 230-some years ago, right? If you're talking about the U.S. Constitution. Yes. I think the U.S. Constitution, what was it, 1789 or so, 17, with, the, with, the, with the Bill of Rights in 1790, I think it's a remarkable doctrine. And I think it's a huge improvement over the Magna Carta, which is written at the time of Anselm, right? So I wouldn't use the Magna Carta. I would go with the Constitution, right? because it's more modern. I think it's an improvement, right? However, the interesting thing about our Constitution, our Declaration of Independence, is I'm not a, I'm not a Scalia, right? I don't look at those documents as if titans and geniuses wrote them and they're etched in stone. Mark may be disposed toward that. He tends to be conservative in this way, <laughs> right? I see them as living documents. And so what fascinates me in the context of American history with these documents is the difference between a Jefferson and a Lincoln. Jefferson was very much of a Lockean, right? John Locke, British philosopher, gave us, he, in, within the social contract tradition, gave the, out, the, the model for what Jefferson basically adopted, right? And again, you have these God-given rights, right? All humanity has these and we hold these to be self-evident, 
right? So there's something big with Jefferson. It's debate whether he believed in God or not. He would claim to be a deist, but he said a lot of nasty things, too, about Christianity. But, again, you have this view that somehow the laws of nature and nature's God have given us rights. Well, then you come up to Lincoln, particularly at the Gettysburg Address, right? Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth upon this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. This is a construct. That's Kant. That's Immanuel Kant. That's not John Locke. And you've got a hundred more years of history here as people are thinking about this, right? So things are changing. I think things are improving. I think Lincoln was closer to what's going on than Jefferson was. But Jefferson was in his time, right? As to Anselm and the ontological uh, argument, existence is not a predicate. Sorry. Yeah. I just want to say I've had classes with both Joe White and Professor Bobro. I've also had the experience of having you as a sub in Professor White's class, so this <laughs> is a subject that is very interesting to me. Was that when you I pretended to be Joe White? Yes, yep. yes. Um, I was quite convincing, wasn't I? <laughs> as you are tonight. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, by your own quote, in reference to the other quote by Albert Einstein, yes. you yourself said, our brains are too small to understand the workings of such a great power. If that is so, then why are we to accept the beliefs that were proposed to us by, small, by brains even smaller than ours at a much earlier period? It seems that you've presented to us a long row of cups filled with water, but have told us that only one will quench our thirst, but if we believe enough in it. Is that for me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, excellent, question, excellent question. Thank you very much for asking it. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, I reject the idea that because, uh, because a point of view is modern, that therefore it's better. I don't know what metric of philosophy that comes from, but I am opposed to it. So I just want to go on record that. The, the fact that it's today doesn't make it a better argument. I didn't, I'm, if there's a book that teaches this, I did never read this book. So please give me the book so I can get myself educated. Secondly, you raise a very, very good question. Uh, it, and it goes to the question, sir, of the distinction between Aristotle's mind and Plato's mind, I think. Plato thought that we could achieve perfection. He thought that we could all be, or at least the Illuminati, at least the, the rulers and the philosopher kings, could, could uh, build an almost perfect society. Not quite. But Aristotle, he disagreed. He said that we can become more perfect. We can strive. We can increase. And this is what we're doing. So I did not uh, offer uh, uh, a, a disparaging of any modern view. Uh, I, I certainly agree that we need to be keep working at it. There's no one cup that's going to uh, quench the thirst, as you so poetically and so eloquently uh, said. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't claim that. But what I do claim is that um, uh, we are, I, I agree with, with, with Einstein, we, we live in a vastly indifferent universe that is both beyond our understanding and even beyond our modest control, we stand about six and a half feet off the face of the globe, and we start uh, uh, issuing uh, directives and dogmas about, about the globe. Professor White said that science does not tell us what to do. Haven't you heard about climate change? Sure they tell us what to do. And he also says that you know, p fat people in Alabama should stop eating bacon. So that's not science telling us what to do? Who cares if people uh, want to eat bacon? Let them eat bacon! You know? <laughs> Freedom, human freedom. <laughs> Let him eat the bacon. It doesn't really matter. So I hope I've answered your question. Okay, another question. I think that was a perfect transition to my question. Um, my name is Hope, and uh, what was your name? Joe. Professor Joe, thank you so much for speaking to us tonight. Um, I have never been to the South. I don't know how unhealthy the people are there. And forgive me if I'm making a generalization or a broad step. But <clears throat> what I do know is that people like food. And so if someone likes french fries, what they really like is food. So if you maybe offer them a banana and call it a french fry and convince them that it's somehow better than the french fry, they might take that and it might make them healthier. It's still food. We're still talking about the same thing, the existence of God or whatever. But we're helping the person become healthier, have a better view of it to improve their understanding. And I think that sort of reflects on what Professor White was talking about and um, how, like, let them eat bacon or maybe give them a better idea that they could eat something <laughs> healthier than bacon. <laughs> Perfect. I just wanted to say that. Good. 
Okay, just a reminder. Uh, <laughs> it's fine. It's cool. Uh, Professor Joe White, <laughs> Professor Mark McIntyre, but we understood. Hi, Hope. Thank you. Hi, Hope. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that question is for Ms. White. Oh, was there a question? Professor there? White. Or your I thoughts? thoughts. Yeah. Uh, well, my point was that you're not going to solve a problem per se with people by just changing the name. Right? If so, for example, if you want a rhinoceros for a pet and somebody gives you a dog, you might be disappointed until they tell you it's really a rhinoceros. <laughs> you don't have a rhinoceros, you got a dog. <laughs> you know, you can't just change names. And that's one of my that's one of my worries. And we haven't gone into details about contemporary theodicy or theology. And there are interesting positions in contemporary theology. I don't know where Deschardins and others are, but like I think, what is it, Rudolf Otto yep. was uh, a fellow who thought of religion as being non-propositional, mm -hmm. which is kind of closer to what I said just a moment ago, that it's not, it's not an attempt to tell you something true, right? In the sense that you're describing the world, right? You're not talking about two young people who actually lived and fell in love and then she poisoned herself. I mean, Romeo and Juliet's a story. Right? And it's a very valuable story, but it's not about the world literally. And so this other view says that both the atheist, the theist, the agnostic, the pantheist, all these people have misunderstood religious language. And they've misunderstood it and think that it's talking about some place like heaven, some place like hell, or that there is this thing called a God. It's not literally about that. It works, and it looks like ordinary language when we talk about these things. But it's a completely different language. And so, again, that's why I said at the very outset, I've just got to hear what Mark has to say. This is, God talk is old talk. I don't know if he's coming in with the old man and flip-flops and, uh, you know, a beard that's in heaven and heaven shaped like a pyramid and it's about the size of Florida and Mother <laughs> Teresa is on the third floor of the condo. I mean, some, you talk to some people, they're quite literal about what this is. And the Bible is history, right, for them. So... I didn't think Mark was going to do that, but my intellectual worry would be that you can also define God so easily as something else, right? And then you've, you've got it. And, and, you know, if it's gravity, I'm okay with you. Call that God. But I think that's calling a banana a French fry, right? I, it's, it, gravity is not God. Existence is not God. And uh, existence is not a predicate. That was Anselm's problem. <laughs> All right, before the next question, I just want to mention terminologically, theology has been mentioned a number of times. That just means the study of God. Sorry, just to make that yeah, clear. Sorry. All right, um, question, another question. Uh, yes, Dave. This is coming from four years of a Catholic high school education. By the way, I can see why you're no longer affiliated with them. I experienced their education. Hell. Anyways, this is a question directed to both of you. If religion is considered, and this is by Karl Marx, the opium of the people, then what is the cure for the criticism of the religious views? Who, who is that directed to? Do you uh, have any, uh, anybody? Both of them. Okay. Uh, excellent question. I, I, wanna make sure I, I, I wanna make sure I understand it. I thought I heard you ask, uh, uh, what is the cure for uh, Karl Marx's uh, declamation that religion is the opium of the people? You want to know what the cure is? Yeah. The from a Marxist point of view or from my from point of view? From any point of view. Oh. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I, I don't put much stock in cartoon like of God. Uh, the, the flying spaghetti monster, uh, the, uh, the uh, Bertrand Russell's uh, celestial teapot, uh, opium of the people. I don't put a lot of stock in those kinds of declamations about God and about religion because I just think they're silly. So I'm not going to try to defend um, uh, cartoon gods. I don't defend cartoon gods. I still maintain that, that existence uh, is necessary and that existence uh, we call God. I've just reiterated that. So that would be my answer. By the way, before I uh, lose train of thought, uh, I owe, uh, no, uh, Dylan owes me, uh, 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 you owe me a mocha, uh, tall mocha, uh, because we had a bet, yeah, you do, because we had a bet before the show, before the show, <laughs> uh, we had, <laughs> Whoa, I gave it away, didn't I? <laughs> the big gave Freudian it away. slip yep. there. Right. Uh, we made a bet that, that, that Brother Joe would not be able to get through this tonight without mentioning Donald Trump one time. You owe me a, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> well, 
Well, in my defense. <laughs> uh, I'll mention you want to take the marks? I'll mention it twice for another mocha. All right. <laughs> Think critically and take your citizenship seriously. This is dangerous. So, uh, <laughs> so about, you, about your remark about the opiate of the masses, uh, mm -hmm. I, I'll just put in the context as I understand it, right, that in the, in the Middle Ages, things were pretty static. There were serfs, right, there was the aristocracy, there was the church. Why did the serfs put up with all that stuff? Why was the feudal system so hard on a majority of the people? It's God's plan. This was God's plan. Right? And so people could suffer through it because they, they accepted God, that God at that time. Unfortunately, that persisted into the 20th century, into the wars of the 1980s in Central America. Right? The United States was backing some horrible people in El Salvador and, uh, who were in government, right? death squads. And there were 18 families, I think it was, that ran El Salvador at the time. And people were trying to start these uprisings. And they finally killed Bishop Ramiro. This was in times of liberation theology, when the church was actually trying to liberate people. But this was how God made it. This, this is how God put, these are the leaders. And so it's hard to get rebellions going for people to step up for themselves because religion was like, for Marx, it was like an opiate. It numbed you to your misery. You just didn't take it on. And you see now that the church is structured in such a hierarchy. It's not a democracy, right? It's top-down management. And so, again, it has, in a Marxian way, it has that kind of opiate effect. So, but I think the fascinating historical thing is that you have Marx in the mid-19th century, and then you have Freud at the end of the 19th century. And again, what's starting to happen culturally People aren't arguing, people are no longer looking for proof for a God's existence. That evidence has largely been abandoned. And I think Laplace put it well. It's just, it's a hypo you don't need the hypothesis. Stuff does come from nothing, which he didn't even know about at the time. And again, this is a contingent world. It's even hard if you follow contemporary philosophy, there's some pretty powerful arguments not even mathematics has necessity anymore. So this notion of necessity, especially if you put it with a spirit that's existing, is so far out there <laughs> compared to where contemporary empiricism is. And I do have this sense that there's a kind of growing critical consciousness that is shared amongst the thinkers of the world. I think that the modern period may have even kept you alive with medicine. <laughs> it certainly give us the electricity we get to turn off and on at our will and the cars. I mean, many of us wouldn't even be alive today if it wasn't for what's been discovered in the 20th century. So again, I just have this, I have this rather optimistic sense, not quite of the enlightenment proportions, right? This is not the 17th century, I think. Everybody's just gonna learn, we'll throw religion out, throw the priests out, it's the great age of science. No, I'm not, I'm not naive, right? And I think the birds of judgment will keep religion around for a long time. But I do think there's a possibility of stability. And I think that that's the way we're heading if we can practice a little more tolerance toward each other and understand how difficult these judgments are. Then if you want to do philosophy, come on in, right? Philosophy, you just don't get your own opinion. And I think as you come, as you study it, you will find there are problems with necessary beings. There's problems with necessity in general, right? And you get necessary beings and people may think that, you know, having a perfection, Right? You can somehow, without looking at the world anyway, get a necessary being out there. It's been a cruel history for those arguments. And so take a class. Learn about these things. We'll leave it there. Um, I had a question about yes. what you said about science. Yes. I don't believe that science like, tells us what to do. I think science, is, like, science says that global warming exists, and the scientists say that we should probably do something about it, and they use science to like figure out how we do that. I don't believe science tells us what to do. Well, um, I, I would hope that you are right, but if those of you who attended the, uh, the debate we had with uh, Professor Dr. Adam Green, uh, we discussed this very point, and he actually agreed with me that there's a, there's a real gap between what the science of climate change, let's just take climate change, because it's a popular topic, there's a real gap between what the data suggests based upon mathematical models which have been demonstrated to be faulty and what Leonardo DiCaprio wants us to do and what Al Gore wants us to do and what Barack Obama 
Now, you don't get to the latte from me be, be mentioning those people. You don't get the coffee. <laughs> I still want my, my so, so there, you're right. There is a, a gap between what, the, what scientists should be doing is making uh, judgments, making, making experiments to find patterns and principles upon which they can make reliable predictions. The problem with global, uh, global warming science, in the last 17 years, not one, not one of their predictions has actually come true made by their political spokespeople, like Al Gore. There's supposed to be no snow on the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. He's predicted that in 2007. There is still snow. All polar bears should have drowned by now. There are still polar bears. So when you have scientists allowing politicians to be their mouthpieces, you don't have science, you have propaganda. Can I? Yeah. <laughs> Just let me go to the other side. Yeah, you may respond, yeah. I respectfully disagree. But, no, the, really? but the philosophical <laughs> point, I mean, it's, you know, well, the science we is have there. One, we have one you know, one polar one. bears, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Uh, well, we, we'll we have, have another debate. But the, we have one more question. Not the philosoph the, I think the interesting philosophical oh, point goes back to an 18th century no, argument no. about facts and values, how you logically move from facts to values. Right, and so any particular scientist, let's say, who believes in global warming and sees this as causing massive dislocations for people, a loss of fresh water, the detriment of crops, well, it's not hard to predict what the next thing's going to be. Starvation, migration, right? And it's not hard to predict what the next thing's going to be. Conflict, battles, right? That's just, sci that's just a prediction. Is that good or bad? Well, a scientist can make a judgment, but that's a different thing that's going on altogether, right? And, and that's where the values are different. The scientist doesn't have to make a value judgment. He can just say, look, you keep on at this rate, you're gonna experience this kind of warming over the next century, and you can see this, we'll show you a model of what, you know, the water rises this much, we'll show you what's gonna be flooded. And we'll show you where the people of Florida are going to be, where the people in Alaska are going to be, where the people in Bangladesh are going to be. There are 20 million people there. They're going to move. Well, you know what happened when 12 million people moved out of the Middle East into Europe. This has not been easy, right? But again, what should you do? The science can't tell you that. Should we accommodate these people? Should we build a wall? Right? These are all the value judgments. And I didn't say, I didn't say, <laughs> I didn't say thump. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just use another word. I'll say dump. <laughs> uh, so, so again, there's an interesting philosophical point here. Scientists will make value judgments, tell you what you ought to do, but that they're stepping outside of science. Then, right? They can only tell us that you know we're gonna. There's gonna. There's likelihood of war. Look at history and this amount of death, this amount of starvation, then we've got to decide. Because if you take an ethics class, you can come up with models, th uh, thought experiments, where it may be the, the moral thing to do that our species perishes, right? We're not just here simply to survive. We're here to live well and do what is just or right. And you can put the species in a situation where, nah, it's our time to go. We don't have a right to take what we need to survive. So, in that way, science can just tell us, yeah, if you do that, you're going to die. Should we? Should we live? Should we take the land? What should we do? That's different than science. That's outside of science, I think. This is for Professor White. Um, if you suggest that we're here to live just and right and well, um, like, if there's not a higher power to determine what that standard should be for us of living right and well, then what has determined that? That's a good question. Uh, those of you who've had a little philosophy, how many people here have had some philosophy? How many people know Socrates' old question, are the commandments good because God commanded? You know, the relationship between morality and religion was fairly effectively severed back in ancient Greece, right? Much like Copernicus and Galileo put an end to the flat earth, right? And they're interesting arguments, and so then the question remains, well, are we in a kind of Dostoevsky world now, where if God is dead, as Nietzsche said, then all is permitted? Well, no. That's a little melodramatic, right? So what does it come down to? Well, again, you can study the history of people thinking about this. Does it have to do with our sentience? We have a nervous system, right? 
How many people here have experienced pain and moved away? <coughs> How many people here have seen pleasure and approached? <laughs> right? Pleasure. <laughs> pain. Oh. Pleasure. Well, what if we add reasoning? Or even better yet, with Mark, I'll just stick with rationality. There is a difference. No, I, I don't know what, anyway. There's reason and rationality. And so, as a rational being, you can say, oh, pleasure. <laughs> oh, disease. Oh, bad, bad, bad. Because you can start to calculate, right? You think it looks like pleasure in the short term, but in the duration, in the long term, nah, that's not a good thing, right? Maybe you can build a system out of that. And maybe if I see you as my equal, then maybe what I should do is treat you in terms of your pain and pleasure. And maybe I look at all of you and I think, oh gosh, maybe it's the greatest pleasure for the greatest number. Oh my gosh, I'm a utilitarian. <laughs> <laughs> right? And then you're a utilitarian. Then you've got a whole principle. It's got nothing to do with God. Very powerful, very simple, tied to the facts. Or maybe you say, no, nah, I think it has more to do with reasoning. I don't think just how you feel is going to be it. I think you have to think a certain way to behave. And if I find ways of behaving that somehow jeopardizes you and by treating you unfairly or not equally, then I'm not going to do that. Because reasoning will tell me there's a contradiction in my behavior. And so I'm not going to do that. Maybe I'm a deontologist. <laughs> Maybe I'm a virtue person. You know, who are, what, there's all kinds of systems out there that we have, and ours is an interesting combination. And you see where, if you've ever seen the film Private Ryan, people seen that film? you start to see where the deontology and the utilitarianism crash, right? At least they bump into each other at a big time. Because the military is utilitarian, right? Sometimes you have to sacrifice a certain number for a greater number, right? So again, you start to see how we think about these things we ought to do, and God never comes into it. And again, I think what you'll see, too, if you, if you just study the history of this, you probably can't get a religious system and its values going unless you already have some sense of value. Right? Because we're not creatures that just follow orders blindly. We want to follow good orders from a good God. So the game's already going. Did that answer your question? Sure. Uh, this is for uh, Professor Joe. Um, I was just wondering where you get uh, something does come from nothing, because you say that science can only take us so far. And I'm assuming that you're... Uh, getting that from physics. I'm not a physics major or a Quantum philosophy physics major. physics is where I've heard it. Uh, I'm not a physics major or a philosophy major, but you just said science can only take us so far. And, mm -hmm. uh, but then you say something does come from nothing. So. And there's dark matter and dark energy, and there's a big bang. How close do we get to the big bang now? 10 to the minus 43rd of a second. How fast is 10 to the minus 43rd of a second? Think about that. Is it faster than this? <laughs> Nobody. See, people in the back are going, what do you do? <laughs> Wait, light's going to get there. And then pretty soon you go, ho, 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 ho. So again, there's, there's, there's so much that's unfolding in just the 20th century. Right? The whole, as far as I understand, quantum physics just threw Einstein for a loop. He's still trying to unify gravity and electromagnetism. He's not dealing with strong and weak nuclear forces, right? And all this subatomic stuff that's going on. And supposedly, if I'm not out of quantum physics, it's not, it's not, it's not a miracle. This stuff goes on. You do get something from nothing. No. So again, but this speaks again to the contingency of the world, you know? And, and Mark might be right. I can't conceive of it. Okay, that's about your conceiving. It's not about the world. That's about your conceiving, right? We have this whole labyrinth theory, M theory now, in string theory. According to Ed Witten, there could be 11 dimensions. What do you see? Three. Where are the others? <laughs> well, you don't need those. You didn't evolve to need those, right? How does a beetle see the world, right? How do these other animals see the world? Some animals don't have color vision. You have color vision. Right? So again, what is reality as opposed to maybe just how we experience it? It could be really different. And right now, we, we don't live in a time of, con of necessity. Right? And we're starting to see this. And I think, in part, 
uh, in our politics. No, you're not going to get another mocha. <laughs> but but you, you see this profound drift toward conservatism, a kind of radical conservatism now. And it's, and it's holding on. What's its model? Make America great again. Right? And again, when you, just, when you just do a survey, about the only people that can answer that are white guys. Right? You don't get answers from women and people of color and minorities in the United States. Right? It's a throwback. And it's, it's how politics works. Right? Now we've got a reaction to all this change. What happened to all these things? How many people are confused about what bathroom to go into? People get confused now. The laws are changing. Where's the necessity? You don't live in a world of necessity. It's not that clear anymore. It's contingency. Right? And so we react. We have people who come up with necessary beings. Mark, you want to do a, just a quick response? Oh, that'll end. Yeah, just a quick. Um, <laughs> uh, very interesting. <laughs> very interesting. If uh, if you're politically, I predicted the the results of the last election accurately in four of my blogs. I blog as the meddlesome priest. I'm a Serbic, that's what he says, uh, and uh, sarcastic, and I predicted it accurately. And I can assure and you. And I didn't. I can assure you that. That white men are not the only people that voted in the last election. To There's Kellyanne. <laughs> <laughs> and on the other, on the, on the last question about uh, th something from nothing, either the word nothing means nothing, means no thing, or it doesn't mean no thing. Either the word something means something, or the word does not mean something. So this hocus pocus, you talk about theology, quantum physics is is very theological, apparently, because we're asked to believe that nothing is something and something is nothing. Now, I don't know where you went to school, but the way I went to school, Joe, <laughs> I would not be able to fly with that. And quantum physics, uh, my last point is, we are conceptual model makers as we proceed through uh, history as an evolving species. We make models. No one mistakes the model for the thing being modeled. If you build a model plane, you don't try to get inside and fly it. You know, it's a model plane. So a little bit of relaxation about these theories that we have, these conceptual models that we build of physics and quantums and, and even God. It's a work in progress. It's not a settled issue. But I just want to thank everybody who was here for your questions and your comments. I learn a lot. I'm sure Professor White does and Professor Bobro. And thank you very much for your attention. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, Mark, come here, please. Let me say just one thing. I hope you enjoyed this. I think it was very informative. Get a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I just really would like to remind you that this is, unfortunately, the last semester at Santa Barbara City College of Professor Joe White that is going to retire. And we should, and we really should, uh, we have to say thank you to him for how many years? 3,400. <laughs> 400 years here. So please. Thank you, Professor White. Thank you, Mark. Go. Well, just let, just let me say this last thing here. These conceptual models do work. <laughs> He's still going. And, and again, he, he is a, he is don't a worry about, a you know, we'll worry about what he can think and can't think inside his language. So, I, wanna, I, I hope all of you here had a good time with this. And I hope, as they mentioned, this is my last semester, that wherever you go in your academic career, you know, make sure that these events happen. Right? They hadn't always happened here. It took some of us to make this happen. Right? So don't just assume that. The academic world's a rich world. And so it's your burden. Carry it on. Make sure you enrich it the next generation. I'll be off someplace slobbering on myself. And so <laughs> the rest of you, thank you so much for your kindness. And be well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You need more of this. I know. Different people too. <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. Yeah.